Okay. I see you, yep. So, this is a found object sculpture of mine, which is, also happens to be a musical instrument, which has been evolving over a number of years. And I wanted to show this to you in the context of the show that I have in Plainfield, uh, because that show is about the interconnection of music and painting. And so is this. These were completely found objects. I don't, I have no idea at all how, what they were meant for. I've integrated them with beaver sticks. These are also found objects. And sometimes the wind can blow and blow the, in a very gentle way, can, 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 can blow the, the beaver sticks into the, into the industrial material. There's a certain irony to that. There's a certain, uh, uh, there's a certain poignancy to that for me. Sometimes I can actually play them. Sometimes a real music can come out of them. Let's see if I can make that happen. There. That was a pleasing sound. I find it a very awakening sound. So, welcome to my show. I'm very happy to be able to show these pieces of abstract expressionism and assemblages, which I've been calling visual fugue because of the fact that they relate to music and painting. They show how music can become painting and how painting can become music. And this was a track that was being followed by Kandinsky, who was a wonderful violinist. Paul Clay was also uh, a wonderful uh, musician. And they were both teaching in the Bauhaus. And the Bauhaus was doing something that was very, very interesting. They were insisting on the equality between artisan work and high art. That s equality, that they were that they were making possible by the educational process they were that they were doing in the Bauhaus in the in the 30s proved to be something that Hitler found to be very threatening, which is why he wanted to destroy the Bauhaus. Why they uh, the artists from the Bauhaus, including Kandinsky and Clay and Walter Gropius. Uh, the modernist architect, had to flee Germany at that time. I have thought that that is an unresolved problem of Western civilization, that the dialogue of which needs to continue. That is why I launched into 
this particular series, which is pictured here in this gallery, the Plainfield Community Center Gallery uh, in Plainfield, Vermont, which has now experienced its 50th year of existence as a non-commercial gallery of non-commodified work. Peter Schumann has performed here. Uh, many p other people have performed here with wonderful pieces. Tamar Schumann's play Shed has been here. Uh, 50 years ago, there was a play here, Not Afraid of Falling, which we hope to uh, revive this year. Uh, but to get back to my painting, <laughs> I, I, I started to make these, these paintings in which I make a painting and then I cut it up. You can see there's a strip here. There's another, there's another cut that goes down here. Then I, then I cut them up and I put them back together because I was not happy with the original, uh, with the original composition. And when I cut them up and put them back together, I somehow found them, I was much more satisfied with them. This is one of them that's, uh, you know, quite explosive. Um, and he, this one, here's another one that's uh, much calmer. And I think it has a, a, a very graceful uh, feeling that came up about precisely because of the cutoff. You can see all of the lines here of the, of the, of the cut-up lines that I, that I made uh, to accentuate certain parts of it and then make other parts of it just uh, disappear. Um, let me show you another one over here. This is the this is the this is the painting that I have used as the main poster for this show. This this has a, an incredibly deliberate cut upness about it. it, and it includes uh, found objects like this is actually a part of a torso that I found somewhere that I included in it, and I I don't know exactly what this was part of. But I enjoy the composition of this as a as a cube, as a cube that wants to break out of being a cube at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can see others that are of a similar ilk. This came from more than one piece, it appears to me. So that's why I call them an assemblage. These are from around the middle 2000s. Would you paint the components? Were they also from that time, or were they earlier works? No, no, they were, they're from that time too. Yeah. And here's a number of pieces that are on cardboard. This one perhaps expresses a certain musicality. Um, at least for me it does. There's this, uh, these forms that recede or that come forward just as they do when you are in an emotional moment while playing an improvisation um, that uh, when you are really engaged in an improvisation, uh, one, one section of music just opens itself up to the next part. It just opens itself up to the next voice, miraculously. I think, you know, I think that is the essence of what drives me about musical improvisation, but also about painting improvisation. Here's another one that has become a sculptural form, which I kind I have really liked that the inside and the outside of it, the unspokenness of it, or the gentleness of the of 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 parts of its speech, because to me it is it is speaking to me, 
are interrupted or accentuated by these large sculptural entities that surround it. Was that one artwork that you cut up? Or was yes. That, yeah. Yes. And this one, this one has to do with a visionary experience that I had in India, in which a very ancient archetypal entity entered my dream. First of all, it started as a waking dream. And then I, uh, I, I woke up in this, in this place that was also uh, an orphan asylum for several Indian children, about seven of them. Then they started w doing their usual morning wake up and the tea was being made. And I decided uh, that I would be able to re-enter the dream space just as I had used to be able to do in childhood. There was a certain period of mine in childhood where I could remember the end of the dream in the morning and at night when I was going back to sleep again, I could pick up that episode and it would, I would re-enter the dream state and the dream would continue. The narrative of that dream would continue. And so I had forgotten about that. That was an early, that was one of those childhood periods that come and go uh, in, in our childhood. And I had forgotten about it for a long time. But after having a, a dream, which was a waking dream, which means that I was aware that I was dreaming in the dream, and then I was waking up from it, I decided to re-enter it. And this entity entered the, the dream sphere, which then became the live sphere in my meditation process, and gave me a teaching on desire. Uh, and th essentially, the teaching was about don't ask for more than you actually have to work with. You will be able to do everything that you need to do with what is around you. You simply need to look for it. You simply need to respect it, to admire it, to find it, to see it as a discovery. In that case, it has potency. And so that is a watchword that has been uh, with me for a long time since I have worked uh, as strenuously as possible uh, to create art for the environment, to create art that relates to environmental issues. So here, here we see a kind of, for me, this is a kind of a structuring of society. This is like the walls of the customs and the so and the so-called mores that we're supposed to be able, that everyone in society is supposed to be able to follow at all times, and. How, how restrictive they are, even though they might be somewhat interesting or they might be fascinating to people in certain ways, but they are also in inhibitions uh, to, to people. Uh, to, the people think they can't break out from them. So we need some kind of a visionary presence in order to remind us that we can, in fact, do this. And yet, what is this hand? pointing to, his hand is pointing to this, this structure, which is a, almost a miniaturization of this larger structure. And I've called this picture fugitive entrance into red, because red is a very potent color. And it, to me, it has been symbolizing the meditation process itself. The, the coming in, the going out of the meditation process, which even though it can become somewhat truncated by the outside world, uh, doesn't necessarily, is, is not about to be obliterated uh, 
uh, so easily as one might think. You know, I didn't know how I was going to get get past this point. Uh, you know, and then it just mm -hmm. sort of happened. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So, this is the piano that we brought in through that window. That was a wonderful community event of bringing, bringing this piano in. Um, when it was rejected, it was rejected by the Monteverdi School. It's a Baldwin piano, which was made in the, like, 1941, at the beginning of the war effort, is when they decided that they would start making these pianos that they could sell in department stores. And this is one of them. Uh, and it has been restrung, but it also needs a little bit of work, which we would love to have some, we'll need to get some funding for that. But right now I'm just going to play something to illustrate, to perhaps be able to illustrate the relationship between painting and music. tell stories with my with my improvs they they turn into stories I don't know how they turn into stories but they do there's a <laughs> and I don't necessarily have to be clear about what the story is I guess that's the way that for me they relate to the abstract quality of thought in which we are subject to many different thoughts that intrude upon each other and that relate to each other, but we don't necessarily understand how immediately. And that is why we need the arts to communicate the integers, the interconnection between our own thought forms. At least that's the way I can think of it right now, today. Here on the piano is another piece of mine that I have put here as a challenge to anyone who confronts this exhibit to see what they could possibly make musically out of this improvisation. Kandinsky called his pieces his paintings, improvisations. Uh, as far as I know, he was a classical musician, however. I'm not sure that he, we are not sure that he actually created musical improvisation. <laughs>
there something about a calling? A calling perhaps to oneself. How does one respond to the beginning of a possibility, of an opening, of a narrative? Enough for now. <laughs>